All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here and see familiar faces. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, um, I'm excited to talk today on behalf of a really large team. <clears throat> so we have a very, very large team here that I'm, and I'm uh, fortunate enough to be able to talk about some of the preliminary findings. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll be talking about some 2022 Lake Huron CSMI updates with our investigated into larval fish recruitment bottlenecks, our investigation there. Um, I'll just say that CSMI stands for the Cooperative Science and Management Initiative. And it's a very large initiative that um, cycles on a five-year cycle on each Great Lake. It's facilitated by EPA on the US side and it's funded through GLRI. So we're really, really grateful for that support as well. Um, <clears throat> And so, um, yeah, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna be talking just a little bit about updates. I'll say that 2022 was the Lake Huron CSMI uh, bio blitz. I'll call it. It's a lot of different agencies that participated in the collection of, of these data. 2023 was the lab processing year, and now we're getting into 2024, which is the synthesis and analyses year and writing. So Lake Huron and uh, well, CSMI activities in general, they're, they're based on a premise of priorities that are set through a lot of different meetings and um, by managers. Um, and so <clears throat> there are priority general themes that, and those are the themes that sort of fit our work here. There are monitoring priorities. One of the biggies is this juvenile recruitment um, constraint question, especially for larval fish in Lake Huron. So this was a pretty big priority that we decided to tackle. Um, what we did in response to these priorities, we explored um, spatial temporal variation in lower trophic levels. So basically we looked at um, lower, lower trophic level indicators, things like zooplankton densities and diversity, chlorophyll A, a, a bunch of other measurements um, that, you, that you just heard about. And how those, and if those have effect on larval fish um, health, survival, that kind of thing, with an emphasis on lake whitefish for part of this work. So specifically, the objectives that we tackled here are: um, it's broken into two parts for this talk. There's a near shore component, where we, our objective was to increase an understanding of early life history, diets, and growth of lake whitefish in Lake Huron. And the near shore, when I talk about that, it's it's uh, it involves beach work looking for these larvae. So this is literally right on beaches, towing gear by hand, waiting on, in the beach, just with people, no boats. And also just off those same beaches using small vessels and other ichthyoplankton sampling gear and zooplankton sampling gear, but usually right off the same beach. So we can do a comparison there at the same time period. So that's the nearshore stuff, number one. And then I'll also give an update on our offshore um, our objective here was to examine the influence of offshore productivity on larval fish growth at a fine, uh, at fine scales, both in terms of time and, and over a large range of productivity. So and also a larger scale in terms of space for our sampling. So there's a near shore and an offshore component. Um, I'll, I'll jump right into the near shore. So um, uh, for this work, I'll just show a, a map of some of the sites here first just to get us all um, onto a map here. We had four sites that were essentially beach sites in the North Channel, and I show those up here. There were two out from Thessalon, Lakeside Beach and Peace Park, and then two out from uh, Blind River, Bahariel Park, and uh, Fourth Sand Beach is where we did a lot of the sampling. We also had four sites in the south, uh, north to south, Harbor Beach, all the way down to Port Huron. We chose these sites because it's a good way to synergize stuff that was already going on um, by talking to Jason Smith and others, by talking to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service folks. There was a lot of coverage in this middle range, so we wanted the two extremes in terms of um, some level of productivity in Lake Huron. So our partner here for this um, nearshore work was Lake Superior State University, and we sampled from, from ice out essentially as soon as we could get out there looking for larvae all the way through late summer to literally track, to try to catch and track, especially Lake Whitefish, but all Corregonines really, to try to track them through their first season of growth. So we really put in a lot of effort to try to sample these almost every week in most cases. We focused on those regions of contrasting productivity, north and south extremes there. 
Um, and their sampling techniques, they, they had to shift as we moved uh, through the season. So we started with this ichthyoplankton sampling. We moved eventually to bag seines to try to continue to catch them. Eventually bottom trawling with large vessels, micro mesh gill net, pretty much anything you can think of to try to catch fish, we tried to catch these fish with. A quick progress update before I jump into some preliminary results. We've, we've done over a thousand, roughly a thousand larval fish toes of some type. So that led to tens of thousands of larval fish being collected. Um, we going after then the, the later growing age zeros, you could call them age zeros or young of the year <clears throat> at this point. We did 44 bottom trawls and 24 micro mesh net, uh, gill net sets for those young of the year. Those areas where we fished micro mesh or bottom trawler and shaded or uh, hashed circles there. So up Thessalon and Saginaw Bay and out from Harbor Beach. And we're about 99% with larval fish ID and genetic confirmation of these, of these larvae. So pretty good progress in terms of um, us moving along here with all these sampling, uh, with all these samples. Um, <clears throat> so uh, first, uh, we just, I'll, I'll just emphasize the beach work. So beach sampling was conducted with a Neustan net. The dimensions are there and um, we hand towed that right up on the beach, as I mentioned. We did that beach sampling on all four sites in the north and all four sites in the south as soon as we could get out there right at ice out. Then at two of the four sites in the north and two of the four in the south, we also matched all that beach work with small vessel sampling right out from the same beach. That way we could compare what's right up on the beach versus just off the beach in about a meter to 15 meters of water or so, um, still at the surface. <clears throat> and so we, we matched two or four sites at each with that small vessel work, continuing to try to catch larvae. We switched then, when, we, when the larvae started tapering off, we switched to bag seining to try to catch those now awkward post-larval juvenile whitefish, very hard to catch. So we, we tried beach seining for those, which is pretty common across um, other agencies in Lake Huron. And then we switched to monthly large vessel um, bottom trawling, trying to catch those young of the year or age zero fish still as they moved more, slightly more offshore. So that's just an overview of the near shore sampling. Um, a quick overall comment here is that we only caught Lake Whitefish in the, at those southern sites. Of all the, of all the Craigenines we could have caught, we only saw Lake Whitefish in all of our larval sampling on the beach or just off of the beach. We saw a high Craigenine diversity in the north as a contrast. Um, we got Cisco and Whitefish. We got round Whitefish, Lake Whitefish. Um, so we, we, were seeing, we were seeing much more diversity there. Um, the DNA confirmation, I'll just quickly mention that it was absolutely critical for this work. Um, just about every toe, we had a subsample that were sent for DNA confirmation of species. And that was, we have a lot of seasoned technicians that do a really good job. And through that confirmation process, they were able to even finer tune their craft of IDing these larval craigenines. But it was critical to do this confirmation and check in. Um, there were sites that busted us. They busted the, the taxonomic keys, the visual keys. And we've refined those keys because sites even a few miles away, um, we would get busted. And then we'd be really accurate in another site nearby. So um, there was a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interesting things to unpack eventually there with why the fish looked different. Um, we got significantly more lar larvae um, right on the beach versus just off of the same beach towing in. You know, the beach is a meter or less of water. Right off the beach is about a meter and a half to out to 15 meters still at the surface. This is really interesting. I'll show this in a couple of figures next. But they were really uh, an order of magnitude nearly. More larvae were on the beach versus just off the same beach. Zooplankton densities were really interesting too. We're in the middle of analyzing a lot of these data, but in general, um, densities, particularly, uh, particularly cladocerin um, taxa, were higher just after ice off across all the sites, but they were definitely higher in the North Channel com compared to those South uh, Lake Huron sites. So I'm gonna show a series of figures here. I wish they were a little bigger. 
um, but in, in uh, I'll show the south sites first. And what I'm essentially showing is just fish densities, uh, mean density. This is fish per cubic meter of water. Um, I'll show the southern sites first, north to south. So it kind of goes as on the map there, just Harbor Beach down to Port Huron. <clears throat> and what you'll see is this is just a comparison across the same time frame, our beach work and our small vessel work right out from the same beach. Um, there are so many larval whitefish on the beach that it actually squashes down the off the just off the beach data quite a bit. I should really log transform this to show you. But the, the long story short is that we caught just about an order of magnitude more fish right on the beach versus just off the beach. And this was pretty consistent across sites. Um, <clears throat> port Sandalac was the next port. You see this really nice. They come up right onto the beach fairly gradually and the white fish stayed around week after week as we sampled and then they drop off and disappear pretty quick. And that same trend if I removed this would show up offshore just about an order of magnitude less. Lexington was a beach only site and we still got comparable densities of Lake Whitefish in Lexington. Now we're getting pretty far south here in Lake Huron. Um, pretty comparable to Port Sanilac. And then our most southern port, Port Huron, right on the beach, similar sampling, similar effort. We got no corregonines to our knowledge at this point. We got larval fish, but no corregonines of any kind at Port Huron. This might be because the current's just absolutely ripping right there, and uh, it, it might not be much of a beach. Now to going up north, our first port is uh, Lakeside Beach out from Thessalon. This is a little bit more interesting because now we're catching Cisco. So I included Cisco in here with the Lake Whitefish. Cisco is orange and gray. Lake Whitefish are still blue. And you can see generally, you know, right away you can see we didn't get as much matching nearshore sampling with the vessel at these sites because of wild conditions out there. But we did hit the peak period around May, mid to mid May to late May, when there were a lot of fish on the beach. You'll see it was quite a bit less just off the same beach that we caught. And so now you have Cisco and Whitefish. So another thing kind of cool about this is that the Cisco sort of um, showed up after Whitefish were there. Kind of makes sense with what we know for early life history for Corregonines. And then the Whitefish sort of disappeared off the, the beach as the Cisco sort of hung around a little bit later. Next site up north was Baharial Park. That's kind of in between Thessalon and Blind River, closer, much closer to Blind River. This one was wild, so also pay attention to the axes here. I wish I would have kept these all the same, but it, uh, it was just incredibly more Cisco on the beach at Bahario Park. It's like a little Cisco sanctuary is what it looks like at this point. <clears throat> so upwards of five, six fish per cubic meter in some of our toes. It was pretty impressive. It actually squashed down the whitefish data quite a bit. Um, but there was a lot of Cisco and whitefish on the beach compared to just off the same beach at the same time. Fourth Sand Beach, that is out from Thessalon, uh, or sorry, out from Blind River. That was a beach only site. Again, we saw, we got out there, it was a little bit more rough conditions. So we got out there when the fish were already there instead of not seeing fish come onto the beach. But so they were already there to an extent, but we saw the peak of Cisco and whitefish show up. And then uh, whitefish kind of disappear and Cisco pretty quickly follow after them. And then we had a, a site up north actually as well, Peace Park that is essentially, it's right out from Thessalon, right in the river mouth of Thessalon River pretty much. Um, but we also have not yet found any corregonines over the same sampling time. We got larval fish, but again, a site in the north that we did not get any corregonines at this point. So a little snapshot at growth. We don't have all of these processed yet, but for Baharial Park, I show a quick image of it, aerial image here. It's the Cisco Sanctuary is its nickname for me now. But um, you see some of the growth here and you can see it kind of checks out for what we know about Corregonines again. Cisco, they, they kind of stay right on that beach as they grow. It doesn't look like new fish are hatching. Um, it'll take a little bit more deep digging into these data to really try to answer questions about that. but. You can see them grow right on the beach over the weeks. Whitefish are a little bit bigger than Cisco. Um, and then whitefish kind of disappear and Cisco hung out on the beach a little longer and continued to, to they continued to grow there. 
So bag staining, we got no corregenines whatsoever. No whitefish, nothing in our bag stains at those southern sites. So all the lar larval whitefish that were there, we, didn't, we weren't able to catch any of those. We caught a lot of juvenile fish, but none of them were lake whitefish. So that was really interesting. In the north, we're just starting to process all these data and get genetic confirmation on all the bag stained fish. We're seeing cisco and whitefish. Round whitefish came in and used that nursery area for a hot minute as well. That was kind of cool to see. So we're starting to see some corregenine diversity in the bag stained up north as well. For bottom trawling, this, um, now we're starting to track these fish as they're growing a little bit bigger. And now we're into June and July and they're about 40, 50 millimeters. Um, again, that's the, just a re up this map. This is where we bottom trawl to try to keep catching those <clears throat> fish. And in, nor in the north, just a long story short, we got what we think are putative age one round white fish and lake white fish hanging out together in the micro mesh. We were not able to get any putative age zero lake white fish up here. The majority of them came from Saginaw Bay. Um, and we got a few out from Harbor Beach and a few out from Tawas. In terms of age zero lake white fish, these were incredibly hard to catch. We actually designed this part of the experiment. Um, it was inspired by a paper by Jim Reckon in 1970, who was then a biologist for Department of Lands and Forests out at South Bay in Lake Huron, who showed that juvenile, especially age zero Lake Whitefish, really preferred the 17 degree water at the bottom, the 17 degree isotherm, and they would follow it around as that, as that 17 degree water creeped around in the bay anyway, they would stay around there and preferred that, and they were sampled there. So we, we did a lot of casts from the large vessel, casting the CTD or the BT, looking for that bottom temperature and sampling there, and sampling outside of that temperature, of course, quite a bit. But we really used that temperature, and we ultimately caught about 111 age zeros, which, if you know how mysterious these things are, we were, we were dancing when we caught 40, and then we caught that many more. So it was really exciting. A little quick look at that. This is just the number of fish we caught per trawl. I haven't done anything. We haven't gotten any further than that at this point. And this is the temperature at the bottom. And you can see that we really did catch quite a few right around the 17 degree. We also had a lot of trawls with no fish, no white fish. And you can also see that we did trawl quite a bit outside of that range from whatever we could find. Didn't get much warmer than 20, you know, 23 C. Um, just a quick look at what that looks like by depth. Same number of fish caught per trawl, same data, it's just the depth. That 17 degree water was right around 15, 10, 15 meters of water is where we were, we were bottom trawling. So right around at the limit for the large vessel, we had to get in pretty shallow. It was also really weird. One day it would be in 10 meters of water, you'd find 17 degrees, and the next day it'd be shoved right up on shore, as was mentioned earlier in these talks. The next day it could be out 40 meters. It just really moved around quite a bit. <clears throat> a quick look at the age zero's growth from those bottom trawl. This is kind of interesting. I also showed the temperature data on a, another axis here just for reference, but this is just the length of those fish over time. And also to say that we caught a ton of them in June in Saginaw Bay. They're around 50 millimeters. A few more in late June. We got them in July in Saginaw Bay at the same general sites. Again, another good haul of them across all those trawls, 43 more. And then the, the water hit about 1920 C in Saginaw Bay and they were gone. So in August, we came back to those same sites. We didn't get any in Saginaw Bay. We got a few out from Tawas and Harbor Beach. But generally, they seem to keep growing for the ones that we can catch. Again, really low catches later on in August. So um, next steps, we had to complete all those density estimates, um, examine those trends much more closely, complete age and diet analyses, <clears throat> compare those between the north and south of Lake Huron, that kind of thing. For the offshore work, a really quick update of um, well, a quick uh, step back in time to 2017. We actually designed the offshore work to really match well with the 2017 effort for CSMI. In 2017, just a quick overview is um, the, the big question was, has decreased productivity in Lake Huron contributed to larval fish bottlenecks? And um, essentially, um, there was the, the sample transects are shown here. It was pretty good coverage. Saginaw Bay was not included in 2017. But the, 
the long story short was that there was no real evidence of uh, productivity induced larval fish bottlenecks in terms of larval very much talking about larval fish i show an adult ale white or um, adult uh, sorry smelt there but this is actually larval fish um, they weren't positively related to like those lower trophic level indicators like zooplankton <sighs> densities or chlorophyll a concentrations the densities of things like larval smelt that is were not related um, so but there was a recommendation to expand this work and look at this a little closer there's there's still a lot to unpack there so essentially what we did is expand those productivity gradients and attempt to provide productivity measures at a finer scale um, across more regions of the lake and more varying productivity regions for that matter <clears throat> so the partners here are epa and dfo and ECCC and NOAA, where they're all critical partners here in this sampling. And what we did is collect zooplankton, larval fish, water quality at those 29 sites shown. Uh, it allows for that good comparison to 2017. We added Saginaw Bay, we added Boot Island. So we added that high productivity area, a, a fairly lower productivity area to the mix to look at this closer. We're just getting data back. A quick update. We have about 98% of the zoops um, processed from that offshore work, 98% of the water sample data, and we're still working on IDing those offshore larval fish. That's quite a beast. We have about 7,000 of them done. It's probably a few thousand more. But we got data back, and uh, this is really interesting. I, I figured this maybe won't surprise anyone that the chlorophyll A in Saginaw Bay was really high, so very productive. If you take that out, you'll see that Harbor Beach was lower than Thessalon by about a half, which I think is really interesting. So a little bit more productive out from Thessalon um, in this preliminary data so far. In terms of offshore shore larvae, I can't really talk about too much yet on behalf of the team. We, we can show some proportions though. So we have two different proportions here of a couple different species on the graph. The blue is the total proportion the percent of the larvae we've ID'd so far so you can see right away that smelt have been the majority of the larvae that we've seen so about 58 percent of the larvae we've ID'd so far from all our effort on the offshore have been smelt um, corregnines are really low two percent so far have been corregnines but in terms of what you catch per toe which is an orange corregnines it's much higher you get a few so 36 percent of our toes we get some a corregnine just not a lot of them overall so next steps are similar we have to complete those density estimates and we have a lot of work to do we have uh, possible if possible we can target aging and analyses of productivity and those how that impacts or influences growth we have those data with all those larval samples we took zooplankton samples as well we also took ponar grabs once the fish got a little bit bigger and were more benthic especially those lake white fish so I've got a lot of preliminary results here that I think I already talked about through the talk. I'll post them up here um, because I think I'm running kind of short on time. I'll emphasize just two more takeaways that much higher density um, in the north versus the south of zooplankton and that much higher density of whitefish right on the beach versus just off the same beach I, I think is really exciting so far. So I'll leave and I'll also put my email up there and Ralph Tingley who co-led all this work, I'll leave his email up there if you have additional questions. Okay, questions from the committee.